set right in tight, right around those, um, those roadkill deer. And then just randomly at random places all over through the bush, just trying to catch this one wolf. And he pulled, pulled his head out and the snare slipped off the front of his nose. And then he walked to the, to go the other way. And there was another snare and he backed out of that one, went to a, uh, a third one back out of that one. And then he thought, Oh, this is bad. I'm leaving. And he ran and he was full on running and he hit one of my random snare sets that I put just in a random spot. And right before he hit that snare, he skidded to a stop, 90 degree turn and booked it out of there. And that wolf hasn't been back since. So I thought, oh man, he might just be unkillable. Welcome to the Stuck and Rut podcast. Got him. Dropped him. Nice shot, buddy. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. Today, we are sitting down with Kyler Knelson. He is one of our favorite Canadians. He's a big hunting outfitter in the Canadian Arctic, and he is a hunting fool. And not only that, but we like to bring people on the show that are real, raw, authentic, um, you know, that are working hard, that are humble. And this guy has worked for that. He He's really humble when you talk to him, but he's very knowledgeable about trapping wolves. So we pick his brain a lot about snaring wolves, how to do it right. Um, you know, how to not wise up wolves, things like that. And he just had so many cool experiences and he kills a lot of stuff. He's also a pilot, good family man, and just a super cool dude to chat with. So hope you guys enjoy this episode as we pick his brain about wolf hunting and other hunts in Canada. Well, Kyler, we're we're excited to just chat and BS hunting, you know, nothing, nothing crazy. We might ask you some questions and just kind of want to pick your brain about the stuff that you do. Adam's like, who is this guy? I don't even know who this guy is. I'm like, I don't know. I just <laughs> follow him on Instagram and Facebook, and he kills a lot of stuff. So <laughs> she's like, uh, good deal. Tana hates wolves and passion. Like, he kills a lot of wolves, big ones, white ones. And I'm like, oh, cool. Let white me, ones, black ones. Let me, <laughs> let me see. And I was looking at it. I go, this guy does kill a shitload of wolves. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. But it's uh, it's what I love. So it's awesome. And you. You own an outfitting business, is that correct? Yeah, um, I actually own three uh, with different partners in each. Um, I run Adventure Northwest in the Northwest Territories and Inuit Territory. And then I run Wingmaster Outfitting here in Alberta, as well as Grey Wolf Holdings, um, which is, I guess, a, kind of a holdings company for that I run all three under. And uh, so that's everything from grizzly bears, muskox, caribou, uh, the odd polar bear, uh, arctic wolves up north and wolverines, I suppose. And then um, uh, down here in Alberta, it's moose, black bears, waterfowl, white-tailed deer, a uh, couple of elk, not not a whole lot of elk, and uh, and a lot of wolves. That's awesome. So it's, yeah, keeps me busy year-round. Busy, living the dream. You live in southern awesome. Alberta? I live in northern Alberta, so I'm uh, I'm right in the northernmost farming community in really North America. So I'm pretty much, I'm about a two-hour drive from the Northwest Territories border. Great. Okay. Yeah, so give us a yeah. background, kind of what your life was like growing up and what got you to this point. You know, it, it's kind of interesting because I didn't come from a hunting family. And my grandpa didn't really hunt. It did a little bit, but not a whole lot. None of my uncles hunted. My dad hunted waterfowl, and that was about it. And then when I was, oh, shucks, 12, 13, 14 years old, I just got, I don't know, I got the fever. And I said, I, I got to hunt. And I said, when I grow up, I'm going to be a hunting outfitter, and I'm going to hunt for a living. And really nobody in our community did that sort of thing. And it was kind of looked down upon. Like, why, why would you do that? And, uh, yeah, and so when I was, 12 years old then i went to the bush and set up my first black bear baits and and bear hunted until i was 14 and then my uncle he, he was a big white-tailed deer hunter he took me deer hunting and i killed my first archery mule deer buck and my first white tail uh with a rifle that season and i was hooked and i said that uh, there's 
there's no way I'm doing anything else in my life. And uh, so I was 18, and or I, I guess I was 17. I was still in high school. And I emailed 100 different outfitters uh, across the provinces here from British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, just asking for a job. I said, I don't care what I do. I don't care if it's uh, skinning black bears to mixing bait or whatever, sweeping the soft floor. I don't care. I just want to start somewhere. And I had two outfitters email me back out of 100. And Todd Lowen from Valley View, Alberta, with Red Willow Outfitters, he called me up. He says, you bet. You can come work. Uh, I need somebody around the, around the yard. And so I show up, and he'd had, I, I just turned 18. Uh, he gave me a guide license anyway. I said, you might need to fill in here or there. Uh, because I've, I've been bear hunting since I was 12 years old. So I kind of knew the gig. And I show up, and one of his guides had quit a few days before I got there. And, uh, and so I ended up guiding that full first year bear hunting that spring. And I think we had almost 100 bear hunters run through, and we skinned bears. So I was sick of skinning bears, and I loved it. <laughs> wow. wow. And, uh, yeah. And so then I turned 19 and ended up getting my outfitting license when I was 19 and never looked back. So is that kind of equivalent to Alaska? You become a, an assistant guide first, and then you become a registered guide later. Is that kind of equivalent to the Canadian system? Yeah, pretty much, kind of. Yeah, you have to have a, you have to hold a guide license for a full year before you, you're allowed to even apply for an outfitting license. And then, in order to get an outfitting license, you have to have recommendation for the outfitter that you used to work for, and it has to. Uh, it's pretty simple, really. And then, Alberta Professional Outfitter Society has to approve it, and then you get your your outfitting license. It's actually. It's almost too simple, in my opinion. There yeah. should be a little bit, uh, yeah, because there's a lot of people that are outfitters in Alberta that shouldn't be. Yeah, um, I think Alaska makes it a pretty difficult process, probably for that reason. Um, so is there a lot of shady guides up there and stuff for outfitters, or is the market just flooded, or both? Yeah, I don't know if it's uh, any different than anywhere else, but yeah, there is. There's, uh, there's a lot of part-time outfitters where they'll have a, a few deer tags here or a few black bear tags, which is cool. Um, I'm, not, I'm not against it at all. Yeah. But um, there, there's people that are outfitting that shouldn't be outfitting because they don't, they don't know the rules, they don't care for the rules, don't follow the rules, um, because they really don't have anything to lose yeah. um, to the get caught, right? Yeah. Um, makes it tough on guys like you. Uh, well, you're talking... At- in the beginning here, you mentioned grizzly bears. I know BC banned it. Um, can you still hunt grizzly bears in Alberta? I Not in Alberta. No, okay. only in Nunavut Territory. Yeah, I, I can hunt grizzly bears in the Northwest Territories. That's uh, for residents only. And it's, uh, it's actually a once-in-a-lifetime in the Northwest Territories oh. uh, for, for, for residents. But in Nunavut Territory, um, any outfitting done in the Nunavut Territory is done through um, some sort of Inuit organization. So we're partnered... Uh, with multiple different hunters and trappers organizations uh, for our tags. And so Adventure Northwest actually has the largest outfitting concession uh, in North America as far as land mass goes. Um, but, but it's all through different uh, hunters and trappers organizations where we have our tags. And so we only have three grizzly bear tags at this moment. Gotcha. Here. Wow. Yeah, and I, I ended up, one of my hunters canceled, um, shucks, what is it, two, two years ago? Yep. And it was pretty last minute, so I ended up taking the tag myself, and I killed a really, really nice uh, Arctic grizzly. Awesome. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. sweet. Um, so you're doing tons of hunting year-round. I can't even imagine. I mean, you know, in Alaska, we have these seasons where, you know, we're shed hunting, and then we're fishing, and then we're hunting, and then we're trapping, so... Can you kind of walk us through what your year looks like? Do you have any downtime, or are you just hunting solid? <laughs> <laughs> My wife doesn't think I have any downtime. <laughs> yeah, well, this year obviously has been different, but on, on a normal year, um, I'll start off the year, well, I'll start from right now. Like, my, my, I got a couple of white-tailed deer hunters showing up here on the, tomorrow, actually. But usually, in early November, I start with my wolf hunts, and I'll wolf hunt November, December, January, and a little bit in February. I'll try and take some time off in February to go uh, 
do the SCI show or different couple sports shows down in the States. And then in March, I run my Arctic wolf hunts out of the Northwest Territories. And that kind of overlaps into my spring muskox season um, on the Kent Peninsula of Nunavut Territory. And so that muskox season runs uh, from the end of March through April towards the tail end of April when I start my Arctic grizzly hunts. And so that runs from kind of the end of April to about May 15th. And that kind of overlaps with my black bear season that I start down here in Alberta. So I'll fly into my my bear camp here in Alberta and run that till June 15th. And then I actually have a bit of downtime from the last half of June and then into July. And then usually by the end of July, I'm getting ready for my caribou and muskox hunts um, on Contoido Lake Nunavut. And that starts usually, I'm up there by the 5th of August and we're there till the 15th of September. And then I get two days at home and I fly into my moose camp. And we moose hunt till October 9th. And then I've got about two and a half weeks of October off before I start baiting for wolves again. So that's pretty much full time. Yeah, you're not busy or anything. <laughs> <laughs> no big deal. <laughs> that's crazy. Living the dream. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, it's busy. I've just, I've just pulled up a map. You're talking about, uh, how do you say it, Nunavut? Yeah, Nunavut Territory. That's crazy. That's big country up there, man. You're going It's remote. huge, huge country. Yeah. So all majority of our hunts are based out of Yellowknife Northwest Territories, and then we fly. We're we're mostly in the on the western edge of Nunavut Territory. Gotcha. Um, so Yellowknife Northwest Territories is still kind of our hub. Is that most of your stuff, or do you travel? I know um, – I see huge mule deer pictures like Southern Alberta and stuff and waterfowl down that way. Do you travel all over the Providence or, uh, or you stay mostly up? Yeah. Um, for the Alberta stuff, I'm mostly in the North end here. Yep. Um, and then obviously when I'm going up North and yeah, I either drive the LNA or fly the LNA. Now that I got the airplane, that makes things a lot easier. Um, but yeah, just drive, drive to LNA. And that's a, it's an eight hour drive for me from here and then i mean i'm i'm eight hour drive north of edmonton if you know where edmonton alberta is yeah yeah we do so um I'm, yeah yeah i i don't have an instagram but tana showed me a little bit about yours you have a, a 185 is that right that's uh, a Cessna 180 okay yeah um yeah it's just got the 470 continental in it and uh 235 horse but i got 31 inch bush wheels on it now that's pretty sweet yeah, so that's my next question is going to ask you. Alaska, we tell people the hunting actually like really isn't that hard and technical, technical, um, but it's figuring everything out. You know, we own a cub and figuring out where we're going to get gas, where you're going to keep the airplane, where you're going to shuttle a moose out to, where you can get another airplane with a buddy to come pick it up. Um, can you talk a little bit about your logistics? Is it really difficult being that remote where you're at up there? Or do you guys have boats and vehicle use as well? Yeah. Yeah, it, it can be logistically very tough. Um, the stuff here in Alberta, not so much because we're not flying such long distances. Like my bear camp, it's only a 25-minute flight from my house. Um, my moose camp is only an hour flight from my house. Um, and that's right on the Northwest Territory's border. So that, that stuff isn't too bad. Um, and the weather down here is used fairly, fairly decent, fairly consistent. Yep. Uh, now when we go up to the Northwest Territories and Nunavut Territory, it's 300 miles from Yellowknife up to our camp. So the weather can change three times before we get there. Uh, so that can be very difficult. Um, we use everything from twin otters, uh, single otters. Uh, we have, the, there's actually a, a big mine up there and we're allowed to use their airstrip. So we, we, I've been flying guys in with dash sevens, which is super handy. You can put 10,000 pounds of stuff in there and still go. Yeah. Uh, and then we got, it's a 45 minute boat ride from that airstrip down to our camp. So if it's too windy, then we can't get guys from the airstrip down to the camp. So it can be a, a logistical nightmare at times. Yeah. Um, especially but, when weather you know, involved. Uh, yeah. But it's just like you guys, I mean, we hunt uh, a remote area and you just make the best of it. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. I mean, I really want to pick your brain on wolves, but. I'll ask Adam if he has any flying questions for you. <laughs> no, I, 
just a couple like how long you've been flying and is that uh is that part of the business or you just use it to move yourself around or how much is that uh, just, uh i've got to do a whole lot more paperwork so i can get my airplane commercially certified yeah. um but to get a to get a 703 for me i, I don't know what it, called for you guys but it's a 703 where i can legally fly my own hunters that's a that's a lot of work um and it costs a lot of money and i'll, I'll get there i was going to do it this year but this whole rona sure set us back a long ways yeah so i'll, I'll work on that next year um so right now i'm just flying guides gear uh, that sort of thing yeah alaska i don't i don't know the exact rules in alaska but i'm pretty sure um you have to be you know, a guide, at least an assistant guide, and uh, have a pilot's license, have 500 hours in insurance, I believe is what I heard on that. And then you're allowed to fly people, but it's kind of claimed as incidental to the business. Um, but a lot of people, you know, hire a guide, and that guide doesn't just take that person out and drop them off. They'll take that person out, drop them off, come back, get their client, drop them off, and then go do all the other flying. So you're a registered guide, but you're kind of hired as the air taxi is how I... I think it works up here, but I don't really know. I haven't, um, I've done air taxi work, oh. which is, you know, just straight 135 flying for us, but, um, yeah, okay. it's, it's well, that'd be, simple. Yeah, that'd be, a lot, that, that'd be a lot easier than it is down here. Cause I have to have a commercial operating certificate. My, my airplane has to be commercially registered, um, before I can legally, um, uh, fly people for hire. Yeah. It's a lot of hoops and stuff. You guys can use helicopters. Is that right? Uh, we can use helicopters, yeah. And these zones up here, we are, we're allowed to use helicopters, um, except for Nunavut territory doesn't allow it anymore. Okay. But yeah, they're, they'd kind of be useless in Nunavut territory anyway. You're way too far away from <laughs> from any base. The, the helicopter would be kind of useless. Okay. Um, I know Tanner's going to dive hard in the wall, so I want to ask a couple more questions before she uh, geeks out on that. Can you talk a little bit about your waterfowl hunting? I uh, I used to do quite a bit growing up, started doing some more this fall, and I've seen some epic videos of Alberta waterfall, um, waterfowl hunting. Um, can you talk about those hunts a little bit? What kind of bird you guys I, I can. I can. I definitely can. Uh, that's what I grew up hunting, so I, I kind of have a soft spot for waterfowl hunting. I don't get to do it as much now as they used to but la crete alberta is is an unknown little honey hole for waterfowl when these birds come off the tundra they haven't been shot at at all and they hit the farmland around my hometown and they're dumb they're they haven't seen gunfire all year they haven't seen a hunter they haven't seen decoys or a blind you really don't have to be a a world champion goose caller or duck caller to bring these birds in. And back when, when I started, uh, hunting waterfowl as a business, uh, what year would that have been? Probably 2012, I think. And I hunted birds for 30 days in a row and we saw it limit the birds every single morning. I didn't even, I couldn't even go out in the afternoon cause they were limited in the morning. Every single day for 30 days, except for one day in between. And I never went more than 30 minutes from my home base. Wow. Yeah. Now, a lot of land has been cleared. Wetlands have been drained. Uh, it, so it's, it's kind of changed since then. It's still really good waterfowl hunting, but it's not as good as, I was, as it used to be. Um, but we're a lot more goose hunting than we are ducks. Yep. That's, Our, that's what I grew up doing. Okay. So you said you were down in Idaho or where'd you grow up? You said? Yeah, just Idaho. And so I got really into it in high school, you know, and I would just drive around on lunch break, you know, and you got your goose calls and stuff hanging off your pickup and, you know, just knock on every farmer's door, like how you did it before all these hunting apps and everything. And, you know, buy the guy a Christmas ham and stuff. And I remember just be <laughs> begging people to hunt their place and finally got some really good fields and, yeah, it turned out to be really good. I mean, the birds are obviously shot up quite a bit by the time they get to Idaho. But, um, you know, I had, I had a couple grand invested as a high schooler, and I felt pretty serious about it. You know, I didn't have the whole trailer full of full bodies and stuff you'd pull out into the field. But we'd drag our stuff out there in those big ice fishing sleds and be out there at 1 in the morning and stuff, setting up with headlamps and 
did pretty good. And um, we don't have a ton of goose hunting up here on the peninsula, a lot of ducks. And so, um, which are cool, but yeah, when you're shooting a 12 pound goose and it hits the ground right next to you, you can feel it. And that's what I, that's what I told <laughs> my kids. I'm like, that, that's cool. I mean, um, I did shoot an emperor goose this year. Uh, they're a lot smaller, but they're real, deal. real pretty bird. Um, I guess that's a big deal. Cause I looked up the, the drawing regs and it's a non-resin. You have to draw one up here and it's like a less than it's harder, harder to get that tag than it is a sheep tag. Um, so I guess it's, I guess it's important, but, uh, yeah, I'm going to have a buddy mount it cause it was a pretty cool looking bird, but yeah, I miss goose hunting a lot. So I may have to call you someday cause it's fun. And Tana's never done it. Oh she's, yeah. She's like, what do you do? Just go down there and squawk on the calls. I'm like, yeah, but <laughs> it's cool. Like moose, I love moose hunting, you know, and I love sheep hunting and bears and stuff and the adrenaline rush. But the cool thing about that, once you pull the trigger, you're done. And then you got to like pack a moose and it sucks with, with goose hunting, yeah. you know, in your case, you send a dog out, or in my case, I just send a kid and say, "Hey, go fetch that one over there," and uh, <laughs> they go grab it, and then then you get to do it again, and you get to shoot a lot, especially if you suck and you get yeah. to keep shooting. It's great. I I agree. It's still one of the things I enjoy the most of all the animals that I hunt. When I can come back and get a big bunch of my buddies together, and we'll do a late season greenhead duck hunt somewhere, and and we'll, I mean, it's just limit out everybody's having fun right you're yep. drinking coffee or visiting and and you don't have to be quiet you're just enjoying yourself and uh wake up and do it again the next morning so yeah i, I love it yeah so you guys are mostly field hunting for um i mean are you shooting canadians um in that early season in the field you were talking about yeah yeah it, it's pretty much primarily all we do is all field hunting even for the ducks um I don't have time to raise a dog right now. I would this year, but uh, on a regular year, I wouldn't. Um, so it's pretty much all just uh, just field hunting. Gotcha. Yeah, that's that's what I grew grew up doing because I didn't have you know the means to purchase a waterfowl boat or anything like that. You got to pretty much have a dog. Um, we were hunting some saltwater sloughs this year um, down the peninsula, and we were. Uh, we had to take a pack raft down, which are cool. They fit into a cub really good, but they're just a pain. And we, you know, just too deep to wade across and a lot of issues with water. So I grew up doing the fields and yeah, if you're in the right spot, that's, uh, like you said, it can be pretty lights out. If you're where they want to be, that, that was kind of what I found out growing up is to do a lot of time scouting and everything and pay your dues and figure out where the birds want to be and be there the next morning. And it can be pretty pretty lights out you don't have to do a whole bunch yeah and that's what a lot of people don't realize is that uh, the majority of the waterfowl hunting is done before you ever set up a decoy it's all the scouting and and asking for permission and being in the right spot if you're in the right spot you're gonna do well yeah how's it work uh where you operate um is it hard to get private land leases are you on like in alaska we have state lands and federal lands you know they're public but you get certain areas, you know, like three areas in the state, guide use areas you get to operate in. How does it work for you and um, getting, like, permits to operate on different pieces of land? Um, for waterfowl hunting, it's a little bit different than the big game. But Alberta is broken up into wildlife management units. And, and you have to buy, the, as an outfitter, have to buy the rights to hunt a certain wildlife management unit. So I have the rights to hunt two different units uh, near my house. And, but there's, there's four other outfitters allow, or three other outfitters, four total allowed in each wildlife management unit. And so it, it's kind of an honor system between outfitters as, as to who hunts what area, but the land is still all private or the majority of it's private land. And, and getting permission for me out here is pretty easy having grown up here and, and knowing everybody. Um, but for, for other people or other outfitters uh, moving into an area that they haven't grown up in, it, access can be quite difficult if, if you don't know the farmers in the area haven't grown up there. So um, that's the downside to Alberta. Um, the upside is it's a lot cheaper to get into the outfitting business than pretty much anywhere else. Gotcha. And uh, what time of year are you guys doing the waterfowl hunts? I wanted to ask this kind of my last question. <laughs> Season opens September 1st. And we're pretty much hunting only the, the month of September because by October 1st, pretty much everything's froze over. 
and birds move south. We'll get a few ducks that will hang around throughout October, but that depends on, on the year, too. Um, like a number of years ago, we had, uh, we had, I guess you guys are in Fahrenheit, but minus 18 Celsius, which would be fairly cold in Fahrenheit cold. as well. Yeah. yeah, and everything froze right solid the first week of October. So there wasn't a bird around after that, but we had four weeks of four weeks of waterfall, and which is still pretty good. Yeah, awesome. And you guys had a pretty good moose season too, didn't you? Sorry, say again. You had a pretty good moose season this year. I saw a couple good bulls you guys got. Yeah, yeah, we did. Um, I had a full season book. And obviously the border closures, nobody could come. So I booked a couple of <laughs> resident guys uh, to come up uh, just to salvage the season, right? Because I love moose hunting. It's, I, I enjoy hunting waterfowl, but hunting moose to me is the best. Like it yeah. doesn't get any better. And so I booked a couple of guys. They came up. First guy, never shot a big bull before in his life. Just had the time of his life and killed a, he passed on a couple of smaller bulls. Which I was, I was pretty proud of him because I thought he was going to shoot the first decent bull that showed up, and he says, "No, the rut's really going. I, I want a, I want a big bull." So he passed on a couple of nice ones and ended up killing a, a 54 inch bull, which in Canadian standards is a, is a big bull. And so he's tickled. And the following week, uh, a guy from Calgary, Alberta, show up, and he killed an absolute whopper of a bull on day two or three, whatever it was. And looks like it's going to be the largest bull moose killed in Alberta this year. Wow. So I was pretty happy with that. Yeah. Was that the one with the awesome scoops for friends? Yeah. 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 That's a cool looking yeah. bull. Yeah. I'm with, yeah. I'm with you with moose hunting. I love moose. You know, it's kind of interesting because here in Alaska, you know, if you live in Alaska, you just kind of have to, and you own a, own a cub, you have to love sheep hunting, it seems like. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, you're one of the first probably big Canadian hunters that isn't just crazy about sheep hunting. Or maybe you are. Are you crazy about sheep hunting? Oh, I love sheep hunting. I've yeah. killed a I've killed a big horn here in Alberta, but I don't know. I love my moose hunting. Right. I'm the same way. Like sheep hunting's fun, but I like moose. You guys killed a couple of whopper moose this year, hey? Adam first and Tana got a really nice one. She got uh wasn't quite as big as mine, sixty four, sixty five, but uh yeah, it scored 218, huge big fronts, really pretty moose. That's awesome. And uh and then yeah, her brother her brother was up here. He went down and uh shot a nice bull with his bow at four yards on video, and then she whacked a caribou and then waterfowl. We get a couple more tags and then gonna start trapping. Good deal. So basically all your seasons are done now and you're basically rolling into trapping. Yeah, seasons. right now just kinda, you know, Working on a little bit of airplane neglected stuff that you can kind of put off through hunting season and kind of get my skis, um, make sure they're ready to go. And hopefully we'll get some snow here soon and put skis on the airplane and start trapping and yeah, good deal. stay busy. Good deal. I ended up, I just bought a trap line here in Alberta here a few weeks ago. So I, I haven't owned a registered trap line before. I was just trapping mostly on, on, on private lands or juniored on, on somebody else's trap line. But this year I ended up purchasing my own. So I'm really looking forward to getting up there. It's a, it's a hundred miles from the road to snowmobile in there to my cabin. But with the airplane, I got to put the skis on my airplane. Now that you mentioned it, I got to put the skis on mine here in the next couple of days. But, uh, so it's a 45 minute flight for me with the airplane to get there or a nine to 10 hour snowmobile ride. So I'm looking forward to spending some time up there this winter. Yeah, but that's that's the ultimate. Have a trapping cabin and have a snow machine in there, and then be able to just fly in for with the airplane and you know put all your covers on and hang out for a couple of weeks and then cover your line with a snow machine. Exactly. Yeah, that's the plan. What do you plan on trapping? Uh, it's mostly martin and and lynx and that sort of thing up there. It's on top of the Caribou Mountains, so it's it's not really a mountain, but it's basically a big plateau. Uh, so there's not a whole lot of wolves and, and that sort of thing out there. There's some big, big moose on the backside of it. And we ran a couple of moose hunts, or one exploratory hunt back there this year. And it's right on the northern edge of my trap line. And uh, <laughs> it's unbelievable, the moose habitat that's back there. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to exploring that area. And there's some wolves right on the backside of that. Um, but mostly it's just Martin and Lynx and Wolverine. Yeah, like yeah I'm excited for Wolverine. That's kind of what we're 
going for this year on our trap line and wolves too. We just, it's the logistics for us, you know, we don't have a cabin and a a snow machine to get there and everything, but yeah. Yeah. I've thought about it. I've seen pictures of guys with 35s. They'll take a skidoo and they'll pull the handlebars off and leave the tunnel and everything on and they'll flip it upside down, you know, pull a belly pot off a cub and tie a full size snow machine or like an Elan or something underneath the cub and it fits barely no kidding you know and uh yeah and uh i'll have to get you a picture it's pretty intense and then fly that out you know tarp it up and then you could have a base somewhere but uh you're lacking a real critical part and that's called a cabin so yeah, yeah. what's your rules out there are you allowed to uh to put a like a base cabin out somewhere or do you have registered trap lines how does it work for you guys <sighs> I think it's kind of like you were talking about the WMU stuff, you know, there's guides that have, you know, certain areas and stuff and these, it's a gentleman's agreement not to step on each other's toes. Like, Hey, you take this drainage and then I'll be in this drainage for sheep and we're not going to crisscross. Okay. Um, it's a small world, probably like your, your outfitting business and stuff. Everyone knows each other and you don't want a bad reputation and trap line. It's just trappers code of ethics. You can go and trap right on someone, but for one, you're competing for animals to, um, I wouldn't want that bad reputation or name, and I, I couldn't look myself in the mirror doing that. Yeah. Um, and I think some of the some of the old salty trappers in Alaska possibly would do bad things. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like I would not want to get in a run in with one of those old guys that traps somewhere forty winters on his line, and he knows it. And then all of a sudden, this guy comes in from out of nowhere to start putting steel down. So uh, yeah, it's I think it's a pretty good. Um, system they have working with people and then as far as cabins um there are trapping cabins around the state i'm not sure how the lease works to to build one of those um there used to be a lot more and i think a lot of them are kind of falling apart nowadays but that is an essential to have a good winter trap line we're just going to spend a bunch of money and you know lose money with have gas and fly around an airplane but it's something to keep us busy and for us it's it's worth it and uh Hopefully we can get some. Canada really wants to tickle a wolverine. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. So, uh, do you have floats, wheels, and skis for your plane? I do. Yeah. I'm not floating doors yet. Uh, that's next time we fly. <laughs> Lucky. Yeah. But I got it all. Oh, man. There's a, there's a <clears throat> big, fat kite standing on the field here right next to me. I might have to shoot him. You, do you need to go shoot it? I always <laughs> love how Canadians say coyote. Coyote. Mm-hmm. I watch a lot of like snaring videos and uh, trapping. I mean, you probably know Marty Seneca. He's in Alberta, right? Yeah, Marty Seneca is in Alberta. Yeah, he's a good guy. Yeah, yeah, dude's a trapping machine. Yeah. Well, um, I'll let Tana ask a couple wolf questions because she's sitting here like shaking. <laughs> I am not want, want to talk about want to talk about hunting wolves and trapping wolves and um, fire, fire away. Yeah, share as much as you want, but. Uh, yeah, when we started this, I said, who is this guy? She's like, he kills a lot of wolves. And I was like, okay, <laughs> let's chat. Well, do you need to go shoot that coyote right now? Nah, <laughs> yeah, I'll, we can pause for that. I'll, this is a hunting podcast. I'll let him walk. <laughs> yeah, I'll let him walk. I'll get him tomorrow. <laughs> Lucky. <laughs> well, yeah, tell us a little bit about your wolf you know, business, how it works. I know you bait. so. Oh, yeah. I'm really unfamiliar with wolf baiting because we can't do that. I bait a lot. Tell us a little bit about that. I bait a lot. (laughs) Um, So I started actually hunting wolves with the intent of just reducing their population. And it turned into, uh, I found that I really loved it. So now I I do it more for fun than to reduce their population. But when I, in 2012 to 2013, we had a nasty, nasty bad winter out here, and it killed 80% of our entire deer population. And wow. a lot of them, the deer just couldn't get away from the wolves. And I own a, a quarter section of land, and I found 26 wolf-killed deer on my 160 acres. And I was so mad. Wow. Wow. I was so mad. I said, something's got to give. I got to start killing these things because they're going to, they're going to kill everything else. Any of the deer that are left, any of the moose that are left after this horrible winter is going to get eaten if nobody does anything. And, um, and I started killing a few and I wasn't really successful until I started 
figuring it out as the years go by, you gain experience and, and you just get better naturally. And so in the last three years, um, there's been over 500 wolves killed just in our county alone. Holy cow. Yeah. And between me and my trapping partner, we killed a third of those. Uh, last year was our best year and we got 46. Um, so it, it's really, really starting to make a difference on the deer and moose populations. They're really starting to bounce back, um, especially in the areas that I'm, I'm hitting hard every single year for wolves. Like the area right behind my house, yep. a new pack comes in and I'll, and I'll kill them all. And there's um, last year, I think I killed seven back there. The year before was four. Uh, the year before that, there was nine, and I got all of them except for two. Uh, the year before that, there was, uh, I, I don't know how many there were, but I, I try and whatever that pack, because I like the deer around my house a lot. And mm-hmm. and so just try and keep the numbers down. So start and help. Are you guys all bait, or can you run them with snow machine, or how do you guys hunt? Uh, in the Northwest Territories, the Nunavut Territory, we can run them on snow machine, so that's what we do up there. But here in Alberta, it's it's either calling or bait. Um and, and the hunting for wolves is not nearly successful enough anywhere, in my opinion, to really make a dent in the wolf population. Um, there's some guys that, that do okay uh, just hunting, but you really have to snare and trap wolves in order to, to bring the population down enough that it makes a difference. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so what was your best day? Like how many have you killed in a day? My best day was seven. Best. Um, wow. Yeah, it was a it was a set. There was a pack of wolves that came through, but every fourteen days, and so we set up a, a bait in there, and it didn't get hit, didn't get hit, and finally the wolves came through, and then fourteen days later they came through again, and then like fifteen days later they came through again. So we let it get hit a few times uh, before we hung our snares. And so we just polluted the area around the bait with snares. Um, our near snare to the bait was probably 50 yards, which is, I don't know, right as close as I usually put it to the bait. And then we put out, oh, I think we had 36 or 40 snares out there. And when we came back, the next go around, when they, they, they didn't come back to that bait, we, we checked it multiple times and they hadn't come through. But when they finally did come through, then, uh, then we caught seven of them. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of our plan uh, this winter. Um, if you don't mind, can you talk a little bit about your your snare and how you set it up? Yeah. Um, and, like, how you hang a wolf set? Because that's what we're doing. We find kills in the winter, you know, and um, they hammer our moose population pretty hard, and we're going to try and get into that and hopefully capitalize on some of those. So, so the best. The scenario actually is if you can find a, an animal that the wolves have killed themselves, it's, it's so much easier to snare those wolves than to snare around a bait site because the, the, when the wolf kills that animal himself, he knows exactly what's in the area. He knows exactly what's around there. And even if there's just a little piece of hide left or a backbone or something, they will come back and, and they'll check it out and their they're next time they, they cover their area. Um, it, it might be a few weeks, but he will come back at some point or the pack will. Um, so yeah, find any, what I, what I do is I, Oh man, where do I start? It's uh, this could be a long conversation. We got time. <laughs> <laughs> if you got time. <laughs> so with that. I guess, I guess to, to narrow it down a little bit, like what, uh, what size mm-hmm. cable and snare do you run a lock? I mean, or what kind of lock or spring? I mean, everyone has different opinions. Yeah. Um, yeah. Kind of what we know. We've never trapped wolves, done a lot of coyotes, but, you know, obviously scent is huge. Um, I like the idea of a kill spring. It's a lot more crap for them to see, but it's effective. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, we know to set in really thick cover, and you don't set right next to the moose because they're kind of wary and – yeah, spend the time and set everything and set it heavy. So if you catch one, you're going to get the six other ones like you did every time. Exactly. Hopefully. Exactly. <laughs> um, the, the biggest thing is, is is set a lot of snares. And if you think a wolf might even, by a slight chance, walk through this certain uh, area, I mean, hang a snare there. 
and take the time to do it right and taking that extra half hour, 45 minutes or whatever it takes to set those few extra snares around that bait site will produce a lot more wolves for you. Um, the, the number, the first few years that I was trapping wolves, I was always in a hurry and I, I'm naturally always in a hurry. Um, I've, I've got to get this, uh, this bait site set up and then I'll go to the next one. I got to get this one set up and I've only got so many hours in a day and I, and I never took my time. And so when I started taking my time, each setting each snare properly, doing it right, camouflaging them properly, that's when you're going to start killing a whole bunch of wolves. So I'll start with my snare setup. I, I've tried all sorts of different cable sizes from one eighth all the way down to, uh, to one sixteenth. Um, but for me, I think what works best is that three thirty second one by 19 cable. And then I'll, Yes, that's what I just ordered a thousand feet of. <laughs> I was sitting here crossing my fingers. <laughs> Good deal. Good deal. You'll like it. And then yeah. I use um, an eight foot snare, which is bigger than most people use. Um, so I can, it just allows me to set that snare a little, like hook it up to a tree a little further away from where I want to set the snare exactly. And I'll still run an eight foot extension on that snare with a swivel between my extension and my snare. And I'll run a, a three thirty second seven by seven cable for my extension. And then, um, for my snare part itself, I run a, um, thousand pound breakaway, man, I should check this out. Yeah. I think it's a 1200 pound breakaway actually, just in case I catch moves. Wow. And then, because I've found, I've, I've had a few wolves break um, the 1,000-pound breakaways in really cold weather. So I, I upped it to a 1,200-pound uh, breakaway, and it seems to work better. And the moose that I have caught accidentally have still broken out of it and, and have been fine. So that's been good. And then I go with the, um, the Magnum spring uh i buy them from marty seneca actually the that super magnum uh kill spring with the trigger on it and i actually like the added weight of that it, it seems to help that snare fire faster so as soon as that wolf pulls on it that extra weight of that spring and and the and all that it just drops it down the back of that wolf's neck a little bit quicker and i find i get a little bit quicker kills yeah, because of the spring, but also because of the, the placement of the snare, it just fires faster and it drops right behind the ears a little bit quicker than a snare without any spring or any weight. And then I use uh, uh, my my lock. It's uh, I get all, It has all the teeth filed into it, um, and it just it holds better. So my snares are expensive, but whatever. The wolf, in my opinion, um, a snare... I don't care what anybody says. It's not a very kind death. So if you're going to kill a wolf, you might as well make it as quick as you can for that wolf, right? Yeah, for, I mean, for their humanity and uh, and it helps holding them too because they can chew out a lot of stuff. They're, they're tough animals. Um, on the on the cam lock, are you just doing a just a regular cam lock with teeth, 330 seconds, or do you go up a size, or what do you use? Uh, I go up a size because we tend to get a little bit of freezing rain here every now and then. And I find when I go up a size, um, not only can it, it, it almost over, um, cantilever is almost all the way over and it, it really, really locks in hard on that three thirty second cable. If you go up a size, but it also, um, if you do get a little bit of freezing rain, anything on your snare cable, uh, it, it doesn't freeze up as bad as just using that three thirty second um, cam lock. Yeah. Okay. Well, I bought some 525 pound breakaways and then, I mean, I've done a lot of research on this and the only things we differ on is then I went to 750. So maybe I'll get some stronger S hooks. I've only seen them for, I think a thousand pounds. I think Marty Seneca sells them thousand pound breakaways. And, um, I just bought the three thirty second cam locks. So yeah. What? Remind me, Tanner. I'm gonna, need, I'm gonna need to spend some more money on trapping stuff when we're done here. <laughs> you know what, Adam? I gotta backtrack here. I gotta backtrack here a little bit. I used to run the 750 pound breakaways and up to a thousand. 
that's what it was, not the thousand or the twelve hundred. So I okay. used to run the seven fifty yeah. and upgrade uh, to the thousand. That's what I did. Yeah. Yeah, don't want to, We obviously don't want to catch moose, but um, yeah, I don't want those opening up. I mean, that's a yeah. You don't want to catch a moose, but you also don't want to be leaving wolves because it's just a, basically a piece of metal bent into an S shape, and uh, yeah, not good. Um, well, yeah, thanks for the help on that. And uh, when you're setting the snare, can you talk a little bit about that? Are you setting it where it's kind of got a hair trigger, so all that weight's gonna gonna fire, and you have it loaded really nice? So or in our country, it's really windy. Um, I had to kind of have to set it back a little bit so the snare lock would kind of have to come up and over the top when the wolf hits it, and he's pretty committed to it. Otherwise, we'd have a lot of trip snares from blowing 30 or 40 all the time. Up yeah, there. see, that, that is a problem here, and it, it depends on where I'm setting. If, if I'm setting in an area where there is a lot of wind, it's fairly open, but then I do set them so they're not going to... So the wolf is going to have to pull on them, like you said, before it will fire. Um, if I'm in thick brush where there's, uh, it's pretty protected from the wind, I'll set them so it's pretty much hair. Like, so that, that lock is right on top, and if that wolf touches the bottom of that snare, it's dropping on the back of his neck. Um, I, I do have a lot of snares that do get blown down, but uh, whatever, I think that's just the nature of it. You're going to have, yep. so, you're going to catch more wolves, but you're also going to educate more wolves. Um, so it's, that's a six six the one half dozen of the other yeah and then uh as far as finding places to set i mean you put your bait in somewhere thick can you talk about how you the technical aspect of how you camouflage the snare do you approach only from the side of the trail and try and not walk in the trail um and how much disturbance do you leave like when i used to trap coyotes they're smart but they're not nearly as smart as wolf i'd put like a little i'd break off a little stick and put it in the snow so they're running with their, their head down. It would basically like a jump stick, and they'd pick their nose up, stick it right to the snare, and game over. Yeah. Uh, I've heard for wolves, you don't want to move anything. You don't want to bring a branch over and wire something down because they're smart enough to say, that wasn't here three weeks ago yeah. when we came through. Yeah. So I, I do it multiple ways. And um, and one, I, I, I'm of the opinion that you cannot hide your scent from a wolf no matter how hard you try. And you're always going to have some human scent, so you, you can't hide it all. Now, I, I, I'm careful to not leave, like, extra scent, but I'm not nearly as careful as I used to be, and it, it doesn't seem to make a difference, as, as big a difference as I thought it would. So I'm setting my snares barehanded. Um, yeah, I still wear the same boots, and I still kind of do the same routine and, and use the same clothes, but uh, I do set all my snares barehanded. Um I do two, I run two different types of baits. So I'll, there's some that I'll set, um, or I'll go into a location and I'll get the whole bait site ready and have all my snares hung before I put any bait out there. So I'll find a location. Okay. I'm going to put my bait right here and then I'll, I'll make trails away from that bait site and I'll, I'll clear brush and try and force that wolf to run along these uh these trails that i lead away from this bait site and i'll run them out 100 yards this way 100 yards that way 100 yards the, the other way and i'll close off everything else so the wolves uh will naturally use these and so i'll leave it and I'll, so I'll, I'll hang my snares in the trees and i'll get them completely ready so there's no bait anywhere but i'll have my snares like hung set ready to go and then i'll come back after all my scent's gone, I'll leave it, let it soak for a couple of weeks. I'll come back, and then I'll dump my bait in there. So when those wolves hit it for the very first time, um, then my snare is already hung. All the uh, all the trails, except the main trail coming off of a of off of a, a cut line or whatever, that main trail to the bait is not set. But as soon as they take any trail. Out of that day, there's a snare hung in there, and there's no humans at all. So that, that's the first way I do it. The other way that I do a lot more, I guess, is I'll, I'll bait an area for multiple weeks and then I go out and hang all my snares and, um, and just try and camouflage them with whatever's in the area. And I, and I approach all the wolf trails from the side, and I'll, I'll reach over, set my snare without disturbing that wolf trail at all and i'll i'll camouflage them a bit but 
try to make it look as natural as possible because if you if you break a branch off and that white part of the broken branch is showing, um, the wolf's not going to walk by it. And I, I, yeah, so you like to approach from the side and not walk on their trail. I always approach from the side. Some of my traveling partners they walk right down the trail, and uh, and whatever at the end of the season it kind of averages out with our he catches almost as many as I do or I catch almost as many as he does. Um, so it's, it's kind of preference thing, I think, but for me, I've just had a lot better success when I approach from the side, lean over, hang the snare and hope it snows a quarter of an inch (laughs) after I leave. (laughs) Yeah. On, uh, on hanging a lot of guys, you know, you can buy a prefab wool snare with the number nine wire still on it. And, um, everything like that do you uh how do you support the snare yeah i, I um, use the number nine i guess i use that number nine wire and i don't attach it to my wolf snare because i like to have uh the option of of hanging that snare wherever i want and so with the long extension if i really don't have anything anywhere to, to hang this this snare on i might take this number nine wire and run it off of a tree branch that's kind of leaning over this wolf trail and so so tie it down from that branch or off of a tree beside the trail and and then hang hang that snare on there gotcha and then on the do you like the extension cable so the wolf has that that lock fall in the back of their head but then they can get a run at it and really really get a good set yeah on the snare yeah but but for me the best thing about the extension is the is the uh, the options you have of where to put that snare, right? Because you can have a tree 10 feet away from that trail and you can attach that snare to that tree. And then you just have a, a bit of grass uh, to where this where this trail is and, uh, and you can still hang that snare there. You can pound, take your number nine wire with a little stake and you can pound that into the frozen ground and attach your your wire to that stake and you can hang that in the grass which is actually awesome to hang in snares in the grass where they're not close to any trees they seem to be um not as cautious in the grass as they are when they're walking by trees and through thick stuff yeah so you take like a piece of number nine wire and like weld it to a nail or something and then yeah. you just pound that into the ground as a snare support. Yeah. yeah, I've seen guys do that. Yeah, some of those eight inch or ten inch nice. spikes or whatever. And I, I don't even. It, it's better if you weld it. It's a lot easier. But if, if you don't have the time, whatever, just wrap it around a few times and pound it in the ground, and away you go. Yeah, that's nice. Um, on the on the swivel, do you like that? Um, in between the extension and the cable, just so if they do start to twist or anything, they're not going to bind that cable up if you don't get a good catch. Yeah, the, the biggest reason I do that is so I can reuse my extensions, and so that extension get all twisted okay. up. Yeah, so I can I, I I use these extensions over and over and over for years. Um, that's the biggest reason I do that. Um, and the long, how are you? Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask, how do you attach the, uh, like, what kind of swivel are you using, and how do you attach the, the snare to that extension cable? My trapping partner, Terry Unra, he makes his own swivels, and it's just a piece of, a um, little bit thicker than number nine wire, I suppose, well, quite a bit thicker than number nine wire, and he just twists it right up, puts a couple of washers in there with a furl at the end, so that it can just swivel right on that, uh, on that snare wire, and then I just run i just loop the snare through that piece and then loop it back on itself uh i don't know how to explain it but yeah something like that yeah that's how i've I've hooked a lot of snares you just put around a tree and then run the whole snare you know make your loop on the snare big enough where you run the whole snare back through it and then it's just hooked onto a tree exactly same same way attached to the extension gotcha cool and then uh you said you don't want to set right next to the bait. I mean, in our case, hopefully we're we're having less educated wolves that haven't been trapped a lot, and you know they're coming back to natural kills. And sometimes they'll clean it up, and sometimes they won't hardly eat anything. Um, or but, they just kill it and move on. Oh, is that right? Is. We see a lot of that too. Yeah, and all the all the wolf lords. Oh, they're gonna come back, and they're just food caching. It's like, well, do they food cache this much? Because I follow the same set of wolf tracks, you know, flying around the winter on skis and looking for wolverine and stuff like that, and they just go boom, kill, boom, kill, boom, kill, and uh, it's pretty relentless how they are. But uh, 
you said said about minimum fifty yards from where you start. Minimum fifty yards from kind of where you start setting, and then how far out will your furthest snare be? Oh, it might be from the. Base. It might be two or three hundred yards, depending on uh, on the situation and and where their their trails all are. But I, I wouldn't say fifty yards is a minimum. Like I'd um, I'd bring them into to twenty five yards, uh, depending on your on your location and and your setup. If you if that kill is in some thick brush and you got really really good trails within 15 20 yards of that bait awesome hang up set them up um so it, it very much just depends on your 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 setup or your location um as to where you're, how far away you're going to set your snares um some of these wolves are super educated that i'm trying to snare now and there's still a couple that i've i'm still trying to snare that i've been after for a number of years and they're just so so smart and so I can't set up yeah. closer closer than fifty to a hundred yards from that bait site. Else, they're they're gonna make a huge loop around it, or they're not even gonna come into that bait anymore. So that's the biggest thing I do. It's just like- on the educated wolves, and also if you set up too close to your bait site, you, you're gonna catch ravens in your snares. You're gonna catch eagles. You're gonna catch all sorts of non-target species. And that's probably the biggest issue with setting right, right in tight, right close to your bait site. Yeah, you don't want those. And those smart ones, um, those probably would keep guys up at night, you know, when the wife wants to pillow talk in bed. Like, oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah I'll, I'll, <laughs> How do I catch that single wolf? Oh. It's eluded me for the last two winters. Oh, man. I'll give you an example. There's one wolf I'm trying to kill, and, and we've, <laughs> pretty much kill every other wolf in that pack my trap partner and i and there's this one wolf and he won't even travel down any trail that we make with a snowmobile or foot trail that we make through the snow just to make because usually a wolf will take the path of least resistance and they'll run down the snowmobile trails yep. or wherever and so he wasn't coming into our bait set anymore but he'd circle around the outside within a couple hundred yards so what i did is i found a couple of roadkill deer or three of them actually, and I, I pulled them into the bush or what was left of them, a um, hundred yards this way and a hundred yards that way and a hundred yards the other way, and I set right in tight, right around those um, those roadkill deer, and then just randomly at random places all over through the bush, just trying to catch this one wolf. And so I come back a few weeks later, and it's snow, fresh snow, and I see this wolf track. Like, oh yes, he's coming. And he hit the, the patch of bush that my snare set was in from a completely different angle that he usually does. He walked in and he had accidentally walked right to one of these roadkill deer and came in the main trail that I'd left open and I just littered the area around it with snares. And he'd stop and you could see he'd stood there for a while and looked around like, uh oh, this isn't good. And then he'd he, he turned to leave in a, like a 90 degree angle that he was walking and he hit one of my snares and his head was in the snare and he stopped and he pulled, pulled his head out and the snare slipped off the front of his nose. And then he walked to the, to go the other way. And there was another snare and he backed out of that one, went to a, a, a third one, back out of that one. And then he thought, Oh, this is bad. What? I'm leaving. And he ran, and he was full on running, and he hit one of my random snare sets that I put just in a random spot. And right before he hit that snare, he skidded to a stop, ninety degree turn, and booked it out of there. And that wolf hasn't been back since. Wow. So, oh man, he might just be unkillable. Wow, that's insane. <laughs> yeah. That's you have to respect them for that. They are incredibly smart. Oh animals. yeah, oh yeah. People don't. I mean, people give them a lot of credit, but man, oh man, they're they're pretty easy to snare the first time. But after, if you goof up, they just learn so fast. They learn so quick. Yeah, and that's what I was gonna say. The hardest thing about both hunting them, if you're trying to call them, or you know, snaring them, or or trying to trap them, is when you wise them up, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you have to figure out a new a new way. So yeah. what do you attribute that success to the most, or what do you feel like the most important thing is to not wise up a wolf? Uh, 
just back out if the situation isn't right. Just back out and don't don't mess up on them. Like if I've done it too many times, especially if I'm calling somewhere and the wind isn't exactly perfect, but I'm with a client and I'm I feel pressured to okay, I've got to kill this wolf, and I'll say, well, yeah. ah, maybe the wind won't go directly to him, or we, or we can we might have a chance of killing him, and that wolf will win me. Well, I'll, I'll never kill that wolf in again. I mean, they just, they just learn. And I think that's the biggest thing. Just just back out of a situation if it's not perfect. Yep, and the, for sure. And then, you know, you're... I feel like you're taking out whole packs, though. You know, it's tough to get a whole pack, I would say. You know, you get a few, you wise up the rest, try to get the rest of them. But it's tough to, to pull out a whole pack. It is tough. It is very tough. And, and I... I've been able to take out the whole pack a few times but a lot of the times there'll be one or two wolves left that and they are super 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 tough to kill but you know if there's only a single wolf or two wolves left their ability to go kill moose or kill deer goes down so drastically that they're not really a threat yep. to to the moose anymore they're living like a coyote um so in my opinion or in my eyes I'm still, that's still a success to me because that wolf isn't going to kill, kill moose by himself. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. We see that a lot. If you get, uh, if you get about two, they're a pretty lethal team, you know, uh, one, one big wolf can, can kill a caribou. Um, but yeah, two of them fall in a wolf track or something in the winter, you know, just out trapping, flannery on skis, you see it. And, uh, yeah, they, they're efficient killers. It's like if they find something, they're going to, and they want to kill it, they're going to, they're going to kill yeah. it. Yeah. So you're doing stuff over bait. Are you also guiding people to shoot wolves over bait? Yeah. Um, or what are the rules there? Yeah. I've got, oh, I don't know, 10, 12 different blinds set up. They're all heated, insulated, elevated off the ground. And, and um, when I'm full on baiting, I'm hauling about 6,000 pounds of bait a week. Um, wow. what do you use? Uh, butcher scraps mainly, but as much roadkill as I can find. Um, and I've got to be kind of careful. The rules for baiting in, in Alberta are constantly changing. So on, I try and bait as much on private land actually as I can, because the, the rules are a lot less for baiting on private land than on, on crown land or a public land. So on public land, there's, I can only use roadkill and and uh, certain stuff from the butcher shop. Uh, so that's a lot more a lot more work. Um, so uh, the majority of my bait sites are right around the fringe land of the farmland, and I find those wolves are actually a little bit easier to kill than the bush wolves that don't have a lot of interaction with humans. Because these farmland yeah. wolves, they, I mean, they've crawled underneath the barbed wire fence. They've heard a truck door slam. They heard a chainsaw run almost every single day and vehicles driving down the highway. Um, so I, I just find that when I'm, when I'm putting hunters out to, to shoot wolves over bait, it's, it's so much, I shouldn't say so much easier, but it's quite a bit easier to kill these farmland wolves. And they're bigger than these, uh, these wolves back in the bush. So what is that experience like guiding people? I mean, do, do they ever miss? Do they ever screw it up? And- oh, yeah. <laughs> All the time. All the time. But, you know, I, I think I would, too. I sit in this box for all day from dark to dark. We can't shoot at night here in Alberta, and that's the biggest thing for us is, is <laughs> we have to abide by daylight hours. So you sit in this box, heated, and you're, you're comfortable, you're relaxed, all day you're in there and all of a sudden a wolf shows up and people just get rattled. Like they get so excited. Oh, there's a wolf here and window gets thrown open, gun out the window. Boom. Ah, oh, man, I missed. And they just, they get too excited. So <laughs> pretty much everybody misses. It's surprising. Really? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So are you sitting in the blind all day with these guys or can you drop them off and leave? No, no, I can drop them off in Alberta. So I can, Good. I'll drop them off in the morning, that pack them a lunch, boring. and I'll go run all the rest of my baits. Yeah. So that'll be all day uh, snowmobiling here, driving a truck to the other ones or whatever, and pick them up at night. Man, that's got to be, 
It's got to be challenging being an outfitter and showing up. How do you? Oh, I had a, I had a wolf come up. Did you get him? No, I missed. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I'm sure I'm sure there's guys that happens a couple times, and you try and tell them. I mean, it's like uh, probably like a black bear bait, you know, but way more intense. A bear finally just sneaks out, and you're sitting here waiting, watching this one spot for something to happen, and finally it does. And uh, yeah, that's got to be frustrating as an outfitter. I feel like that'd be really frustrating. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it is frustrating because, uh, I mean, opportunity rates, I mean, guys, I've got about an 84% opportunity rate for hunters that come up and only a 64% kill rate. And so there's a lot of people that miss. And it, yep. it, it's frustrating because it not only, uh, it not only educates those wolves, but it, uh, yeah, whatever, you get it. Yeah, how how long do you sell the wolf? Is it a week long hunt, or how long are guys coming up? Yeah, six days of hunting. Yeah, so they're, they're, okay. Yeah, I'll bring them in on a Sunday. They hunt uh, Monday through Saturday and fly out the following Sunday. It's a lot of sitting. Is there a limit on how many they can shoot? No, not in Alberta. Is it one? You can shoot as many as you want. I've had multiple guys shoot three, but I've never had guys shoot more than three. I've had one guy miss. I've had one guy miss seven. But. Uh, <laughs> oh, that was a funny, funny, funny hunt. I was pretty frustrated after about the second or third one. And after that, it was just, it was just funny. And, uh, and the guy was, he was the right guy for it to happen to. And he, he really didn't care after shot three or four because he, he ended up killing three that week. It was a crazy, crazy week of hunting. We had a huge storm roll through and then it just got like, it warmed up got calm and there was wolves everywhere and it was so much fun but yeah he could have he could have killed ben <laughs> holy cow. yeah that's nuts yeah. i don't know it must just be that freak out when you see a wolf because i mean they're hard enough as you know to find them and then see them and then then you have to shoot it yeah <laughs> so when people miss it's it's frustrating but yeah. I mean, I've seen it. I was with my dad once. He missed a black wolf at 100 yards. I'm like, how did you miss that thing? <laughs> <laughs> it just happens. And... Yep, it just happens. And you know what happens to a lot of guys that are really, really, really good shots? I get guys that can shoot a 1,000 yards ring steel all day, and they're, they're good hunters. But it's something about, I think it's sitting in the blind for so long in anticipation of something showing mm-hmm. up, and when something finally does, things just get rushed and and you don't follow through and and just make sure you're on them i, I don't know yeah how far of a shot is it from your blinds to the base that site? depends on the site but the majority of them are under 200 yards okay. i used to have them a lot closer probably... yeah they're smart though i could see that being an issue probably like you were saying um your biggest hurdle like alaska we don't have shooting times alaska is such a large state that um waterfowl there is which is weird but everything else if you can see it through your scope you can kill it and um yeah you guys probably struggle with that because they're fairly yeah they're almost like bears they're very very nocturnal animal uh if we could shoot at night here over bait i i mean it would be i wouldn't say a hundred percent success rate but right next to it because I've got cellular trail cameras on some of these baits that I that have cell service. These wolves are on these baits pretty much every single night. I mean, some of these wolves have grown up on these baits. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, but we just can't touch them. So I don't know. They'd probably learn too that once they get shot at at night, then they wouldn't show up at night as much. But I don't know. Like right now, they're it, it's pretty much every night that they're there. That's got to be rough. Yeah. That pissed me off. Yeah. You put all this work and everything into there, and then you get a guy named Harry that misses seven <laughs> times. <laughs> and then it's just like, oh, man. Yeah, running to my wife. Look, just got a picture. Yeah. They're sitting there right now. <laughs> you know? Yeah. That's got to be rough. It, it is. Um, it is. So you guys aren't allowed to bait at all, like even for trapping? You're not allowed to bait? No, for trapping. Yeah, you can. Um, certain stuff you can use. Um like hide of a moose and, you know, like bones and stuff like that. I think you can, but unrealistic with a super cub to haul out enough bait for, sure. for 
a wolf trapping site like that. You know, you could bring like a moose leg or something like that, but, um, yeah, we're mainly just finding kills for sure. Yeah. Hopefully, like you said, and that's encouraging. We can find enough kills where they're naturally getting, I've heard that from a lot of old time wolf trappers and pilots that, you know, even six months later, even a year later, they'll come back to where that was in different things. And, um, just check it out so i mean i know where kills were from last winter the winter before and we could go set around those bone piles and stuff like that and different things and then um yeah hopefully find some some uh wolverine sign we see a lot of wolverine tracks and uh go from there are you guys allowed you can't uh are you guys allowed to run them on snowmobiles uh yeah. yeah it's vague like they changed some verbiage like you can position a wolf to shoot it and then from a non-stationary snow machine or something like that i i'm not really sure um but we're just going to try and get more into the trap i mean as you know it's it's difficult they're smart but you got traps out there you're always hunting pretty much which is which is really cool um are you guys all snares or do you use any footholds uh this year i'm going to try the footholds i bought a whole bunch um last fall so I'm going to try a whole bunch of footholding this year. Cause I've, whatever, I've done the snaring and been there, done that. And uh, But right now, mm-hmm. uh, the last number of years, it's all been snares. Gotcha. Yeah, and then do you guys have, I'm sure you got locations where uh, you don't have cell service. Do you run cameras on all your baits? Because we picked up a few, where we get, stealth cams? Like $130, mm-hmm. $150 a piece for yeah. stealth cams. Um and we did a lot of research. By that, I mean Tana putting something on the Instagram and said, what do you think's best? And everyone said stealth camera. We're like, okay, well, whatever. Let's get some of those. Yeah. And uh, we're going to try and hang some of those at, like, the bait sites we get just for pictures. I'm sure we'll get a lot of birds and maybe some fox and stuff. But it'd be cool to get some actual camera pictures of uh, of wolves at a kill. You know? Yeah. Um, with cameras, I, I find if you if you hang the camera right on the bait site, um, where there's a fair bit of human scent where you're returning to, where the wolves are to a certain point, uh, accustomed to human scent, then those cameras are fine. But I found I've, I've been trying to get a trail camera video of a wolf walking into a snare just to see what happens, um, multiple times. Yeah. And I find that the wolves, they can hear the sound of that camera going on. Even like, I can't hear it go on or something. There's, there's something about it. I don't know if it's um, if they can see that infrared glow or, or something, but they do not like it. Um, around the bait, around yeah. the bait side, it's fine because if you're there all the time or whatever. Um, because I, I go to back to my bait side so many times over the course of the winter that they're completely used to that. So I can run cameras right on the bait sites within 50, 60 yards, no problem, and they'll still come in. But if I run these cameras, like a hundred yards, 200 yards back from the bait site along a trail where I've got a snare hung up. I mean, it's every now and then they'll still get pictures, but so often they'll stop and they'll, they'll walk off that trail and they won't use that trail again. And it's surprising, but, um, a good wolf trapper here in Alberta, he told me that and I figured, ah, can't be. And then I started paying attention and it, it was true. So that was an interesting yeah well they got like a seventh sense yeah so are you doing most of your guiding and i mean i know covid's right now the borders closed i think still is that correct but i have a lot of guys that ask me like hey how could i go shoot a wolf somewhere um do you know anybody that guides wolves so you know for people that are listening what's the process to go and hunt a wolf with you uh in alberta it's pretty simple i mean just give me a call or text or email um, and and we'll set it up and the license is a hundred bucks pretty simple you you can hunt from oh the season opens like long before I start hunting wolves so basically all winter um, and then I also offer hunts in the Northwest Territories for wolves and that's a standalone wolf hunt and we run them on snowmobiles up there and so we'll we'll drive up the ice roads north of Yellowknife, and we'll, and it's, I don't know how many hundreds of miles up these ice roads we can go, and it's a completely squat and stock type of deal, and we'll just try and find caribou, wherever the caribou are, there's going to be wolves following them eventually, and we'll just babysit the caribou till these wolves show up, and then uh, and then we run them on snowmobiles and shoot them, 
So that's actually a really, really, a really fun hunt. <laughs> <laughs> that's a blast that is a blast i'm sure you, i'm yeah. sure you guys have done it but it, yeah it's it's a hoot we never have we got a super cub so we don't we're broke <laughs> um as you know airplanes are cheap <laughs> and, oh man that's got to be that's got to be hard on your machines because my buddies that have done it and i've talked to old timers everything goes out the window and you see a when you see a wolf it's full pin until you until it's dead <laughs> yeah. there's no there's no half throttle <laughs> yeah there's no half throttle and if you go on my instagram page you'll see a snowmobile burning to the ground uh, from last year one of my guys norman peters he hit a rock and chasing a wolf and burnt the snowmobile right to the ground uh but we got oh, so, no. <laughs> but we got the wolves and i hadn't turned so that was good <laughs> that is good are you chasing them down um and then just getting close stopping and shooting or do you chase them down shoot them with a pistol as you're going or how do you guys do it uh we'll stop and shoot um it's, it's hard for the client to to shoot off the back of the snowmobile so in, in the northwest territory the law states you're only allowed to chase a snowmobile or wolf on a snowmobile if you intend to kill it and we're obviously intending to yep. kill it so it's legal but it's very hard and in it's kind of dangerous to have somebody that you don't know you don't know their how safe they are with a weapon riding on the back of the snowmobile and then try and shoot a wolf as it's moving and it's rough everything's all windswept the snow is hard and it's a pretty rough ride so we'll always stop yeah and, and get off and, and shoot and so the, it's always a running shot but uh i mean it's still wide open you'll you're gonna get the wolf um may, maybe yeah. not in the first couple of magazines but you'll eventually get them <laughs> <laughs> just give an ar yeah. here's another mag keep hold a little higher there harry yeah, um, exactly. yeah. like I, I envisioned this you guys had a bunch of clients on snow machines but that would probably really cancel your insurance quick because be hard for guys to you know ride and not tip over and hit stuff and crash so yeah. they're just hanging on behind you and you're going mach three across the frozen ice and tundra <laughs> Until you whip this thing sideways and stop and say, okay, get off, lean it over the seat and hammer Exactly. It. That's exactly how it happens. And, like, <laughs> wow. there's very few things in life <laughs> I enjoy more than coming over the top of a hill somewhere, following a set of wolf tracks, and you look down on the lake and there's a pack of six, seven, ten wolves out on the, out on the lake, and you've got two guys and four wolf oh eggs. Oh, my gosh. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, I mean, all hammered oh, out. That hammer sounds down. so fun. <laughs> that sounds really similar to bush flying, like thousands of hours of sheer boredom and then interrupted by crazy amounts of terror and panic where you just go from nothing, <laughs> totally calm, drinking coffee, hey, let's pull over, take a leak, and then you're on a wolf track and three minutes later, it's literally full pen and this guy's hanging on the back saying, what did I get myself into right now? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's half terror, half enjoyment, half <laughs> who knows what. And... Uh, <laughs> like, I mean, you can hunt for five days <laughs> and not awesome. see a wolf track. And and you think, like, yep. there's no wolves in this country. And you come over a hill and there's a whole pack of wolves there. And you're limited out in 15 minutes. You're done. And it's, whoa, yeah. what just happened? Yeah, that's, that's insane. That's got to be so much fun. So are you doing a majority over bait or is it kind of a mix between the bait and then chasing them on snow machines and then also calling them? Yeah. Majority over bait. I think here in Alberta, it's because it's, it's right next to my house. I live here. I can do it all winter. Um, stuff yeah. where I'm chasing with snowmobiles, that's only legal in, in Nunavut and the Northwest territories, but it's so far for me to travel to get up there. And the window of yeah. decent weather up there is only about three to four weeks. If we start in, if we start in February, uh, when that ice road opens, uh, you're going to be in a negative 40 pretty much every single day and windy. So that's not really a whole lot of fun. And once you get into March, the weather gets a little nicer, the days get a little longer, and you get really good hunting. And then that ice road closes usually that first week of April. So we get four to five weeks of really good hunting that we can do up there. So that's what that's. So we're kind of limited and yeah so then down here in alberta this is where i do the calling and and hunting over bait and i do that all in november december january and part of february and when you call them do you do you find much success with that um yes if it's a pack that hasn't been called to before or the younger wolves in a pack yeah um 
for me, where I'm hunting, I mean, now this year I'd probably have decent success. I didn't do a whole lot of calling last year, and now with not a whole lot of clients this year, I probably won't do a whole lot of calling. And so we'll get some new wolves in there. But they just learn so fast, and, and I'm not a... I'm not going to lie. I'm not a world champion wolf caller. I'm not very good at it. So that's probably the biggest reason why I don't do it. Like I, I've called in a few dozen wolves, but um, but I wouldn't say that I'm really, really yeah, good no. at it. So the success rate, no big deal. <laughs> just just a few dozen, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that's over that's over years and years, right? So. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, they're definitely tough to call, for sure. So, Kyler, can you tell us about the... Everyone sees a picture hanging up and say, oh, this wolf was 200 pounds, 180 pounds. No such thing. Tell us the average size <laughs> from a guy that's actually, maybe metric, but an actual size of like a big alpha male wolf. <laughs> you know, say you're say you're with a guy sitting in a blind, the whole pack comes in to the bait, perfect scenario. You say, okay, that's the alpha, that's the biggest, shoot that one. What's your average size of the wolves you guys have? Average size that we kill is probably 95 pounds, believe it or not. And a 95-pound wolf yep. looks like a pretty big wolf. Um, I've killed a few over that 130 mark and one that went over 140. But his, his, wow. Yeah, his skull was over 18 inches. Like, he was huge by, like, by a fair bit it's over big, 18 inches. But, it's bigger than black bears. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But there's, there's no wow. such thing, in my opinion, as a 200-pound wolf. That's it's... Uh, no. I don't know. There might be some Yellowstone wolf out there that weighs 200 pounds. But in the few hundred wolves that I've killed, no. It's no such thing. And the Arctic wolves are actually, yeah. the Arctic wolves seem to actually be smaller than the timber wolves we killed down here in Alberta. The Arctic wolves, yeah. they, they stand a little taller. They might be a little bit longer, but they're, they're lanky. Their fur, their, their skin is thinner. Uh, their paws are bigger, they're longer, but they're just not as beefy. They're not as heavy. Yeah. So a, a big Arctic wolf yeah. will weigh about a hundred pounds. A big timber wolf down here will weigh about 130. Very, 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 yeah. very difficult to kill a wolf over 130 pounds. Yeah. Our buddy killed at what? 134. Was that last year on the scale? That was the biggest. See, that's one. a monster. But that's that's a really really big wolf. Yeah, it also just eaten some caribou, I think. Yeah, I think it was, had a full belly too, and that you know that can fluctuate twenty pounds on a wolf. They can just go. It so, can. So it can. The biggest wolf that we so huge when they biggest wolf that we killed. My my dad actually killed it, and that one was just over one hundred and forty pounds, uh, and it had an empty stomach. It's huge. So uh, I'm wow. Yeah, it, it it was substantially bigger than any other wolf we've ever killed. Yeah, but when you pick that thing up and bear hug it, especially depending on how big you are, um, with a full winter coat, that thing could look 180, you know, okay. especially put a full belly in it. That's where you, that's where you get all the guys holding the picture of, oh, this is a 200-pound wolf. Like, ah, hard to say. Yeah. Probably probably not. Um, can you talk about, I mean, you put up a lot of wolves. Can you talk about, um, like, prepping them and stuff and any tips you have on putting up wolf hides and green belly and stuff like that. If you're getting them right off a kill, do you got to get them skinned out pretty quick so they're not turning? Yeah. Our winters are fairly cold down here, so I'm, I'm fairly lucky when I snare them that they're, they're usually frozen pretty solid. Um, if they've got a full belly and they're laying on their belly, you're going to have a bit of green belly in, in, on them. Um, my taxidermist friend of mine, he gives me some sort of powder, and I'm I'll have to ask him, and I'll have to get back to you on what this powder is. Um, but I, it's a mixture of borax and, and something else. But it's that it's that something else that's in it that's the good stuff. And I'll rub that on that green belly, and it actually just locks the hair in place, and you don't get any slippage. And so I've been able to skin some wolves that I'd normally throw out because of the green belly, and I'll I'll rub this stuff on it and it actually locks the hair in place, and you'll you'll save that wolf. Um, I'll get back to you on what that is. Yeah, and yeah, for people who don't know what green belly is, it's just their, their stomach acids are so full, they've just eaten 15 pounds of caribou or moose or your bait or whatever, and then they die with all that acid and that big, basically, Thanksgiving dinner inside their stomach that it, it slips the hair, even at a really cold temperature, yeah. possibly. Yeah, 
yeah, yeah, you can have a wolf and it's 40 below and that wolf is laying on his belly after he's eaten uh, a full belly full of food and he's going to have green belly guaranteed. There, there's no other way around it. Yeah. yeah. Well, man, you got me all fired up for wolves this yeah. winter. <laughs> Just ready to go kill. <laughs> yeah, we're excited. I'll have to get your number. I want uh, I want you to send me a picture of your snare, if you don't mind, and just kind of see your setup. I don't have any. I'm off the gram, but uh, maybe I'll creep on Tana's phone a little bit and follow you. Well, we have his number now, so. Good for you. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll, just te- I'll just text you like people usually do, the old school. I'm trying to, I'm thinking about just getting off all social media. Good. You kind of need it for your business, and so does Tana, but man. A lot of it's just so fake that I'm I'm over it. Yep, <laughs> I I agree with you, Adam. That's that's for sure. It's really good for my business. I sell a whole whack load of hunts through social media. But if I didn't yep. if I didn't have to use it, I wouldn't use it at all. That's for sure. Yep, you I'm can't the same way. you can't get away from it. It's free advertisement. You yeah. Know? You look what Instagram does and stuff and things like that. Besides all your death threats, you're doing pretty good for free advertisement <laughs> yeah. off Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> I'm always kind of nervous. I'm always kind of nervous when wolf season rolls around and I'm posting pictures of dead wolves. Like one of these years, Instagram is just going to delete my account. And be done with it. <laughs> they might. <laughs> <laughs> they might. Yeah. But so far, they haven't deleted Stuck in the Rats either. Yeah. We, it's crazy, but at least you're doing the management. You know, somebody has to manage them. Somebody does. So. Yeah, somebody does. Yep. Yeah. Well, yeah, thanks for coming on today. We can let you guys go, but I wanted to uh, just ask you really quick because I heard you say polar bear and, you know, there's a lot of things in the world that I've, I feel like I've liked killing. I don't need to go overseas. I don't feel the need to go hunt Africa or anywhere else, but if I could kill anything or hunt anything, it would be a polar bear. As a resident of the United States, can I kill a polar bear in Canada if I have a lot of money? (laughs) Yes, you can. Um, can you can you take it out? Of, you, but I don't think you can take it at out. At this right? point, you cannot take it out of Canada. Um, if if Donald Trump ends up winning this rotten election, hopefully that'll change to where you can take a polar bear back to the United States. But there's still all those tags that were allocated when the borders were open are still being allocated now like there's more polar bears now than there ever has been in the history of the world as as long as we've been tracking bear polar bear numbers so if you have a lot of money you can come shoot a polar bear and it's about are they fun to hunt you know it's kind of an uneventful hunt really um you spend a lot of time on a dog sled and, and cruising around it's a big adventure it's huge on adventure but the actual yeah, killing of the polar bear. It's pretty neat if you if you've never done it before. And I actually personally haven't killed a polar bear. I still can't afford it, even though I'm. I've never even seen. I've never been for it, but I haven't <laughs> so. killed one. But once you release the dogs, the dogs go bay it up. Um, I mean, it, it. Once you release the dogs, you have to kill the bear because you're not going to call the dogs off that polar bear. Basically, that's that's yeah. how it is. So it's kind of it's very cool and. I'm like, I'm with you. I really, really, really want to go kill a polar bear at some point in my life. And, and I don't know what it is about it, but I just want to do it. So how much money are we talking? 40 grand US. Yeah. Well, start saving up, Adam. (laughs) (laughs) I've just, I don't know. I've never had the big desire. I didn't know it was with dogs. I thought it was you know, snow machine and um, going out with native people and kind of spotting stock on the ice pack kind of thing. But I I don't know. I was just thinking about that. Tana, so I really want to kill one. I'm like, all I really want to kill is big moose. You know, I'm just looking for a just a 240-inch solid moose that I can mount. Yeah. But I think it would we'll just be see. cool to do once, you know? Yeah. We're trying to buy a hanger house before a polar bear. So I think that's more, <laughs> that's more essential now, you know, and uh, maybe a set of wheel skis. But uh <laughs> Yeah, she can dream. <laughs> oh, well, maybe someday, but yeah, yeah, Kyler, thanks for coming on. Where can people find you if they want to book a hunt? With uh, them? They can find me on Instagram at Kyler Knelson or um, just text me, call me seven eight zero two four seven zero two four seven or email Kyler K Y L E R at wingmasteroutfitting.com. dot com. 
That's it for today, everyone. Thanks for joining us. If you like the podcast, please leave us a review and also reach out to us with any questions. Until next time.